I feel that some of you out there <laughs> at home alone, sitting there, sound of my voice now, are under the influence of alcohol or other drugs, <laughs> sitting there watching me in that state of lowered consciousness. <laughs> Can't take it straight, huh? <clears throat> Time to play, what is it? If it is beyond ordinary experience and beyond routine knowledge, then what is it? <laughs> Having no patio furniture, one man decided to become his own. <clears throat> his brother, who had spent six years becoming a structural engineer, was a bit peeved at the rapidity with which his sibling achieved his success. <laughs> A certain advantage is had by the archery contestant who brings his own target. So much so that you never hear of this happening. Because those who do it are already far too smart to ever get caught at it. <laughs> After years of study and school attendance, one day, as this one student glanced up at the instructor leading the class, he was rendered near dumbfounded by the sudden realization that those who already know the answers are the ones who write the questions. <laughs> Need I tell you that after that, things were never the same. <laughs> How it all works in lands you never even heard of. Yeah, right. In this one place, the king announced, He in my kingdom with the smallest mind may marry my daughter. Then to himself suddenly thought, hell, I'll marry her. <clears throat> and thus, history buffs, does the intellectual family of man multiply and carry on. Neo NASA update. The only thing staying between a man and a voyage to another world is him standing on this one. At first you might think that the simple require only simple answers, but not so. <clears throat> Those the more embryonic need increasingly complex explanations of even the most straightforward affairs. As they were discussing headaches and other petty annoyances, one father said to his son, It's not just that dumb people are serious, but they want to have serious conversations. <laughs> they both grabbed their heads in mock horror, <laughs> or maybe not so mock. <laughs> To try and reduce the risk of being seen as a cow, one man would often break out singing, I'm an old cow, and <laughs> by the by, thus have come forth many of man's preeminent leaders, particularly of the religious and mystical variety. While we're waiting for them to bring your birthday cake out, we could play a little question and answer party game. Yay! Okay, question. How can you absolutely positively tell a more conscious man? <laughs> now get this. He's the one who's almost impossible to entertain. Woo, here comes the goodies. Ordinary minds have trouble dealing with this kind of stuff because they find it difficult to oppose or criticize it. For if they specifically attempt to refute one particular idea regarding man and his life, and if their argument begins to appear correct vis-a-vis -vis what DKS has noted, all it does is make men look even more dense and dazed than they normally would be. Religious myths realigned. Don't look ahead. Judgment day has come and gone in the time it took you to blink. There is nothing to expose. We have all given ourselves away. The two biological conspiracies the hormonal and the neural. First is the alpha wolf conspiracy, wherein the more aggressive of men will be physically in charge. And if you're also an alpha type, you'll have no complaint. And if you're not, there's nothing you can do about it anyway. Then there is the neural alpha wolf arrangement, which has yet to be permanently established. Don't any of you think you're dealing with some sort of inverted deja vu. It's some of what I was talking about last time, I just put down actually in a written item. That's right, some of you are going. <clears throat> of course, I feel that some of you may be listening tonight under the influence of 
Well, some of you hear worse than drugs or narcotics or alcohol. Under the influence of your own mind. <laughs> A thought so shocking as to make one's bladder verge on being weak. The problem. The problem with naive minds is not in their taking life at face value, but in their taking their take at face value. Simply being simple-minded provides not sight for point-blank vision. Every time life would correct one, one of his stupid little mistakes, this one man would say, Boy, do I feel dumb. And life would say, Yeah, you're supposed to. <laughs> <clears throat> Could have predicted where the laughs were coming from on that one. Shouldn't say that. Now you won't react. And now... And from our fairly big book of wisdom. <laughs> Every day is the same to a dead man. And more or less so for everybody else. In the view of certain neural explorers, it is not death that kills you, but repetitive thinking. Another example of how physical health is a self-regulating affair and mental not. The symptomatic irritation of hemorrhoids will stop with a cessation of food intake. <laughs> well, maybe there is something that you could use here regarding the mind. <laughs> Men originally came up with the concept of God due to their discomfort with the idea of chance. A bit later, the more sophisticated of the simple-minded conjured up the notion of science to replace the first group's original replacement. The relationship between playing with language and seeing things head on is similar to that between the academic study of humor and being a comedian. One man began to periodically feel, I've about laughed myself out. But every time he did, damn if life wouldn't run out another humorous act on stage for his light-hearted entertainment and edification. Hormones lead. Neurons complain about them leading. <laughs> Query, what is the sound a wolf makes in the city? Query, what is the sound of the city the wolf hears within himself? To the many, consciousness is the problem. To the few, the solution. Forget the meaningless specifics. Those seeking greater neural expansion have but one foe. The normal, natural human condition. Special alertness alert. The purpose of chapped lips is to drink turpentine. It was special for me. Was it special for you? Mm -mm. <laughs> Communications won't list or come sit on Mr. Bell's knee. One man says he now has but one wish regarding his own mind, and that is that it get an unlisted number. <laughs> Neural thespian therapeutics, or, hey, we could have all been contenders. As they walked down the stairs from class, Marky punched his buddy on the arm and said, you know, the great thing about being a method actor is that you don't have to act. A lesson learned well eons ago by the collective mind of men. Would have helped if I'd named him Marlin. Huh? No, I didn't. Our inspirational thought, no, inspirational moment for the day. Mm -hmm. One man would periodically try and treat life delicately, but would always end up saying, ah, fuck it, and revert back to his normal previous behavior. Amen. And now a tip for those on commission. If you don't whine, you can't sell. Amen again. One day, two trees were just standing around talking. One of them said, if a man alone in the forest speaks, will anyone hear him? And the second tree replied, isn't that taking the notion of inverted metaphors a bit too far even for us? And the first one said, huh? What? What was that? Is somebody there? <laughs> Query. <laughs> Why so often do ordinary mystics want to gather together and retreat behind monastery walls? So they won't hear everybody laughing at them. 
<laughs> well, I say, old sport, a rather indelicate response, if you ask me. Okay, query again. What pertinence has delicacy to a more open and alive mind? Those who initially blinked are those who now take life the most seriously. Fear and uncertainty can certainly assist a man, particularly if he is the one causing the fear and uncertainty. In the preceding where it said man, read life. Mysticism to a sick man is being well. And a father told his son, the secret for which men seek is right before their eyes, but they do not see it. I tell you this not to make you feel bad, but to note to you how life has made us all down there blind. Reviewer writes, I have come up with this progression in my own mind. Am I on to something? I think of it like this. In the excitable non-standard realm, expanded consciousness comes from alertness, alertness from attention, and attention comes from remembering to try and be more conscious. Am I getting closer? Yours, ETC, period. Oh, et cetera. I thought, <laughs> thought it was his name. The meanest dog runs the physical pack, but who leads man intellectually? The simple always believe that the questions are simple and the, quest and the answer is complex, while a more perceptive man realizes that all of the normal questions are, right from the beginning, far too complex, and that all meaningful answers will prove to be quite simple and straightforward. In other words, Gertrude, just the opposite from what everyone believes. So what else is new? Everyone likes to wear glasses. It helps remind them of what it is to be mortal. The preceding public service announcement was brought to you courtesy of the Get Out of My Face Bullshit Foundation. <laughs> A potpourri of energy saving tips. There is nothing to cry about in the, in the intellectual world. The civilized cry only over words. Don't cry over spilt milk. The simple cry at the side of milk. Milk only frightens the worldly intellectuals. There is nothing to cry about in the intellectual world. And this item concerning the planet's two military establishments. At the Hormonal War College, the first thing recruits are taught to say is, Go to hell! While those in Eurotrain are taught to say, I surrender. Sure, there was no combination between those two items, right? They just happened to have fallen the same page. That was theatrical sarcasm. Either that or it wasn't theatrical. Everybody is a walking time bomb. But no one ever goes off except the insane and a more conscious man. And there is a slight difference between the two. A bit of humor for all of you insane. Ha <laughs> 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 ha. <laughs> Another example of why life is not as it usually seems to the simple. If you can throw a person down and sit on them and make them smile in the process, you have either made a friend for life or else saved the cost of a new sofa. <laughs> a father told his daughter, if you're still seeking forgiveness, you're still missing the point. In his campaign to simplify and forth ratify his life, one man permanently removed the word surreptitiously from his vocabulary. In case of emergencies, he did, however, keep one small synonym sticed away. For a moment, a man laid down his book and aside his prevailing view and wondered, how did man ever get involved believing that depriving himself physically would produce intellectual rewards? Historical correction. When the simplistic of old and of today say purity of heart, what they in truth refer to is a nonpartisan mind. It would not be a total surprise if someday, some today, 
would not be a total surprise if some today would opine that it was in times gone by easier to be a mystic. Well, I'll give them this. It sounds like it, don't it? One man said, don't talk so fast, and replied, don't listen so slow. And just as he was about to say something else, interrupted himself and warned, at your own peril do you replace talk with think. And now from our wasted effort, tip files. Trying to make an ordinary person feel dumb is like trying to make shit stink. If you'd like a cutting edge distinction between a more conscious mind and an ordinary one, it is that the latter is always slightly puckered. How grown-ups are kept from seeing what's going on. If you put a child's present right out in the open and tell him it's not a present, he'll never suspect a thing. Advanced exposition of the just dread. None of the above efforts are necessary if you'll just never tell the child the word present. A gift is a terrible thing to waste. A secret is a terrible thing to waste. A gift is a terrible thing to miss simply by it being made an apparent secret. City culture. When artists don't know what to do, they'll do something crude. And critics will attack them for their savagery until next season when they'll decide, declare that sophistication has become overdone. <laughs> Men of war conceived of the locomotion mechanism of tanks from observing the above. <sighs> Notation 96 regarding how to be more intellectually alert. Remember, fleas follow elephants, not the other way around. And a viewer's, quote, personal thinking said to him, I don't get it, and neither should you. Oh, sweetums. Those sincerely seeking the great conscious experience have two true friends, one who knows and luck. <laughs> true indeed and irreplaceable at any cost. Why archaeological things mainly disappear? <laughs> Many a civilization, speaking for its collective mortal inhabitants, and vice versa, has stood, surveyed its neural surroundings, and declared, if I can't complain, I shan't remain. And as far as rat hole history goes, that, dear Goebbels, was that. <laughs> Though it is easy for a magician to make vanish that which was near there to begin with, it seems more vexing for a man to be so confronted as regards himself. My great God, Horatio, I do believe that that is the rise and fall of me. Well, what, sweet Cicero, did you expect? Science, and then some. The primary forces running this universe are the opposing forces. A student of science who comprehends this has a lot of questions immediately, sees a lot of questions immediately answer themselves. And now some of the unrecorded history of man recorded for the first time. What is the first thing man did and still does immediately after blinking? He turns and walks right off in the wrong direction. And did I hear someone say, well, just what is the wrong direction? <clears throat> well, I'll just tell you. After blinking, every direction is the wrong direction. Now, funny, you don't look all that surprised. Life has made a donation in your name to its favorite charity, itself. <laughs> to wit, you. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, we're getting somewhere. <laughs> Some Mother Teresa look-alike con conference. <laughs> Dialogue. Same page, folks. It might be connected here. Dialogue. Justice is relative. Well, that works out just right, since so's injustice. Soliloquous. 
aside. <laughs> Soliloquus aside. Yes? I know it's not a word, but I put it there. A soliloquous aside. Well, now, I better read the whole thing or you'll forget where you were. <laughs> As if that'd make a lot of difference, right? Dialogue. Justice is relative. Well, that works out just right since so's injustice. Soliloquous aside. Shh. Don't let that get around. Instead of a dog or a cat, one man kept modifiers. <laughs> well, you see, son, the road to ruin's not paved since it's not going anywhere. And the man with the modifiers added to speak of. <laughs> Trying to expand consciousness beyond the limitations of thought is like hearing a surprising noise in your house late at night, and the only possible way to ever know what it, what it is is to not ask. <laughs> Note, the dependence of thought is the limitations of thought. Hormones and neurons in history. The reason that Attila is better remembered the Plotinus is that Attila didn't take any shit. In the eternal struggle between man's mind and his body, his body says, what struggle? And his mind says, who dragged me into this? One guy's trans-existentialist explanation via verse. We live in our head, we live in our body. This makes us weird, this makes us odd. <laughs> A man with a self doesn't have to be concerned about self-esteem. <laughs> the, the selfishness of domination. Those who want to lead other men look after themselves no less than does life itself. Who is who the leaders work for, so how could you expect other what? Wise. Distinctions with a distinction. Thought transient. Consciousness not. Except that when you move into higher neural realms, the opposite seems true. A viewer asks, is it possible that up until recently the hunger for transcendental experience was just one of several subtle side nudges life gave man to make him more civilized? Facts of residency. Hormones are neurons lease. <laughs> Definition. Traditional mystical practices. Things to do until the great rocket bus arrives. Definition. Gurus. Men who for a price will save you a seat on a crosstown bus. <laughs> If run-of-the-mill thoughts couldn't think of the past, they could scarcely run at all. A man routinely opinionated and partisan will also be matter-of-coursely dazed. In the land of illusion, since there is nothing to be known, those professing ignorance can pass for wise. The relationship of the monastic life and the intellect is like that of taking a tightly wound watch into seclusion and hoping it'll calm down. <laughs> a simple test for those who would be more complex. If you take what anybody else says seriously, you're stupid. That's simple enough. A story. For 42 years, one man talked to himself and finally realized it was to no avail. Another definition of a more conscious man. Those who can look life dead in the eye and smile and not blink. Well, hey, somewhere down the line, 
he's done it already. Why not now? Now that he knows what he's doing. The distance between thought and consciousness is the same as between hormones and neurons. We're just thanks bunches, says a viewer. Just the kind of encouraging thing I just love to hear. Thanks bunches. In case the rest of you are interested, he just verbally exemplified the distance I just mentioned. To the dreamers, their life is the preface, the experience, the climax to their life. While to the experience, the experience is their life and all else a mere preface. Ideas as foodstuffs. Amidst city intellectual affairs, another earmark of a more neurally active man would be that he could take vitamins and make them feel better. <laughs> Version 2. He could take amphetamines and make them more alert. <laughs> Conclusive version. All that he thinks makes him more alert. What less would a reasonable man do? One guy was careful about what he said and said little. Then he got even carefuler -er and said nothing. Holding high the mental glass of the city up to the light of reason, a man said, I will drink no common wine, get sick, throw up and have a hangover before it is time. <laughs> and in an overwhelming voice, the city shouted out, It's time! It's time! It's always time! <laughs> the neural and hormonal merry-go-round. In a fit of spiraling exasperation, the king passed sentence on the upstart. By pointing to the executioner and proclaiming, I condemn you to eternal death. And the whole village grabbed its temples and thought, what? <laughs> Thanks bunches. I went to all the trouble to lay it down. And To do. <laughs> to the dreamers, their life is the preface. And dreamers, uh, if we're going to discuss it, I would say those who believe that they're interested in affairs extraordinary. <laughs> to such dreamers, their life is the preface. The experience, this extraordinary experience of which they dream and write, the experience, so they dream, will be the climax to their life, the payoff, while we're going into contradistinction. That is not the same as a contrabassoon. <laughs> while to the experience themselves, the experience is their life and all else a mere preface. Is that too convoluted? It reads good if you could look at it. I'll, I'll speak for you. It reads all right. The point is, those who dream of being able to free consciousness from thought, whatever they call it, if they're sitting around meditating, trying to have a Zen or some particular yogi experience, or trying to commune in some mystical or Jewish mystical tradition that they're trying to communicate directly with, the Almighty. I've given it to you a bit more direct that they are attempting to be conscious without the limitations of thought. So such dreamers, the dream is, whoever they are, seeing, now reading a book or if they're off attempting to pursue some tradition, some practice, the dream is that life, as they know it, ordinary life, is simply a preface and they experience will be the climax. Now there's nothing wrong with that. That's just the first half of the little item. 
what's an ordinary person going to say other than that? And they have said it in words very similar to that. Ordinary life, the carnal life of man, the routine life of man is like an anteroom, like a foyer, at least to a real person. It's just like an entryway into the great cosmic connection of getting back in touch with the Godhead or with the original spark to the Big Bang. And that everything else, there's one experience, say they're working. If we found somebody, even a dreamer who seems apparently actively involved, someone who has given up the ordinary life and gone out to a monastery, and they are meditating, eating a special diet. They're actually engaged in some activity. I'm still calling them dreamers in the sense that they have yet to have the experience. But if you ask them, you know, is it worth it, and et cetera, How, how's it going, are you still interested? And if you tried to get them to speak along such lines, they would, and as I said, people have in the past said very similar things, their expression, their feeling is, and I'm not trying to trip them up by putting words in their mouth, it is actually a feeling, and all of you have had it, that if there is such an experience, if the day will come, if I can achieve it, if I can wake up myself cosmically, consciously to some other level, that, I mean, there they are. They've changed their whole life and built around it. So it's, it's obvious they're going to say that will be the payoff. That will be the climax to my life. And I'm just sure it'll be worth it. Every time I read about it, every time I hear about it, I am even more convinced that I'm doing the right thing. So they would say the experience, the experience, in quotation marks, you know, the experience that is going to be the climax to my life everything else all this is preface all this is working toward it you know, fasting depriving myself physically which you notice I didn't pull that item out to rub that in but all the efforts I'm making is simply the preface to it everything I've ever done up until this point whenever I get to the experience assuming I get there then everything up to here, up to that point, once I get there, I just know without any doubt, it's all, it's just a preface. I'm just working. The contradistinction, the other half of the item after that is, for those of you taking notes to correct my English, after a semicolon, I know it could have been something else, but after a semicolon it says, while dreamers take their ordinary life to be a preface and the experience to be the climax of their life, not a comma. Those who are experienced would see it, surprise, surprise, in what is almost the opposite way. That the experience is their life. That anything other than the experience is just a preface, it's just fooling around. Everything else is a hobby. Uh, since we're not playing any known TV game and I don't have any prizes to award me how about a challenge how to make that seem practical it would be practical in the sense that everyone at one time had the experience you had the experience when it meant nothing. You had the experience when you didn't know you had the experience. That you look, you just had the experience. Everything that all of the great writers, every dream you ever had, which all the dreams, if you're just a dreamer, all the dreams you have are based upon plagiarism. I mean, you read somebody's description, somebody's apparent description of some mystical experience they had, some major cosmic conscious breakthrough they had, and you may read it very likely. And go, aha! And, uh, well, without any doubt, all of you went through some version of that. that you, know, you read somewhere, somebody. And went, aha! That's it. It just struck you as correct. But the point was, it is still plagiarized. In the sense that someone else had to describe it. And I'm not saying that the uh, description was invalid. But you start off in a position of being non-creative. Of being a plagiarist. But before that, before anyone knew, everyone had the experience. If you were genetically, physically sound enough to grow up to be a normal, square human being, fairly sane, then you had the experience. 
the very experience that you then read about 20 years later. Now I say the very, although life itself and the experiences of man are not truly fungible. It is still the experience. It's just not quite the same. But the experience, when you read the first time that somebody described, no matter what it was, it could have been in religious terms, it could have been in more psychological descriptions. It doesn't matter. You read somebody saying that through whatever method they pursued, whatever happened, whatever seemed to have brought them there, whatever preface in their life, whatever tradition and practice they did, and they went one day, and then they go on for pages, and they describe what they saw, what they thought, the effect it had on them. And just as soon as you read, you went, yes, yes, yes. Yes, that. That's it. No one ever considers this. How do you recognize it? No matter what it is, even though it comes in different varieties. How are you so sure that that's it? I know the ordinary people could very easily. Life will make them do it. Would come up immediately with some sort of would-be uh, spiritual, routine, metaphysical, occult, new age kind of response. Like, well, you know, God puts it in us some way. Or the great cosmic forces give us a hint. Those of it, us that it selects, it lets us know. When we find the truth, we'll recognize it, and etc. How did you know the one that you read? You ah, that's it. How did you know? How you knew was that you'd already had the experience. Everyone has looked point blank into the face of reality. Everyone has had the, the, yes, the mystical experience. But it was meaningless. It was, although this is not true, I'm strictly being poetic now. That's why I started this a few days ago and even presented as a fairy tale from another planet. This is not the point. And I am being a bit poetic, but there's a purpose in my pseudo attempt at a poetic telling of one part of it. The first, that first experience of everyone looking right into life for a split second, remember this is not true really, but it was almost like a test. And if you were a mystical dreamer, then of course I wouldn't have to say more because you go, aha, uh -huh, it was a test to pick out the chosen people, the rightful followers of the mystical dream, they would say that. I would be more likely, even while being a, still a bit in the land of poetry, to say it was more the other way around. It was to really check that you were in sound <laughs> mental condition. That life looked, as I've told you, and it's, you, know, you came up there on that little conveyor belt, and it was judgment day. Everybody else keeps thinking it's somewhere in the future. That was judgment day. And you had a split second. But you had nothing to tell. You were not being called on the carpet. You were not being called to answer for your life. Because up until that point, you had had no intellectual life. I know the ordinary people would call it spiritual life. But you had been nothing but a rolling doo-doo factory. <laughs> but now here you are. You are a real little boy or girl. A little... A little human, and there you come up on this conveyor belt. The intellect is about to be fired up, and you're one, one time at least. You're one shot at the mystical experience. You come right up in reality, and you look right just, just like that. You're a creator. The ordinary would want to say, but it's just reality. And you look, and almost everyone looks away. And we've been through this. There isn't oh. Useful, I'm not prepared to try to ramp some kind of useful addendum or extension of my made-up tale <clears throat> at this time. Because there's nothing to prove. But there it is, it looks, and you look away. You blink. Ordinary dreaming mystics, those who have not had the experience, would take that story and go, uh-huh, it was a test to pick us out. You could look at it that way, that's a great thing about the binary operations of a partisan mind. You can holler out, three and two is five, and everybody goes, yeah, and one of them is the magic group. And if you look down, and let's say all of you matches divide up into threes and twos, and you look down, and yours, on your shirt's a three, 
I mean, it's not in question which one is the better group. Sometimes we hope for the best. <laughs> the ordinary dreamers would think, well, if they took that story, that we had a chance, or it was a test, for life to start picking out who could make a, a mystic later, who could have greater expansion of their awareness and consciousness later, and that was like the original test. And then later, you know, he sent me, reality sent me to the right book or to the right guru somewhere. I was drawn to some great mystical system. But life had already you know, picked me out. You can look at it that way. If the whole world is five and everybody's either a three or a two, you got your choice. Since I made it up, I suggest to you it was more like just a quality control. If you just came by and just reality just glances, and you're supposed to look off. Because you're not supposed to know what to make of it. You're supposed to be, as the great English imperialist, I think, used to like to say, you know, your mind's supposed to be a blank. And it's life checking that you got your little, you know, blank chalkboard of a mind. It's like it sounded and having cracks in it. It's like life can almost tap you on the, like a little Barbie doll, at least on the head, because you're already supposed to be physically sound enough to even make it on the conveyor belt. But you come up, and it's as though life looks, and rather than taking it that life picked you out as for some special purpose, it's more like this, that reality looks, and you, you glance off, and you're the right kind of person. I mean, that's what you're supposed to do. You don't know what the hell to do. Now you are at whatever age you know I'm insinuating. We're talking about just a few years of age. And there it is, reality itself, the universe. Everything looking at you dead in the eye, what are you going to do? <laughs> now, right, right before you're a doo-doo factory, you would have gone, you know, you could have looked right in like him. <laughs> but we're talking about that critical moment. <laughs> Suddenly, you cease to be simply the doo-doo factory. <laughs> Suddenly, you're about to think. In that split second, life wants to make sure that you're going to do all right. And so it looks at you, and it's like, you know, tap on the little doll. And you look, and you go, some don't, but there's so few is the point. If it were, if, like I'm describing, a kind of quality, a neural quality check, just for sound, routine construction of one's higher neural system into the neocortex, the few who do not look away. And I really hate to do this, but I guess I will. You know, they look and go, ooh. There it is, just a few years of age. And they have the experience, which everyone does, but they had it. And they didn't turn away. And they go, ooh. And it's like, and it's moving so fast. Think how many people are born every second. And we're just talking about on this planet. And it's like life, reality, let's say, realizes that you, you, know, you, 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 some, that you didn't actually blink. But my God, you're one out of, a, you know, 100 million it's like life can let somebody, you know, one Barbie doll with a small crack in it. And the thing is, a small crack is not even a good metaphor any further because it's, you do not go out and ruin life. But it's just that you are, you are not what life had in mind. Not bad enough to throw you out. Because if, if it was bad enough to reject you, if you were a cull, for those of you who ever worked in the chicken business, if you were a cull, life would have culled you in a sense, physically, that you would have been born so physically disabled that you wouldn't even gotten this far in quality control. So that's not the problem. It doesn't have to cripple you. There's so few people, and assuming that you're physically sound up to that point to make it up to that line of quality control, the experience of you in life, you in reality looking point blank for a split second, and you don't blink, and let's say that life is aware of it. But again, one out of a hundred million going by, and other than that one thing, you're all right. It lets you slide, Clyde. Uh. Once that happens, now let's divide life back up into the threes and the twos. This group of people, the would-be mystics, the potential, those who could potentially, in a sense, exert, execute to some degree their own evolution while they're alive. Which, if you're going to do it after you're dead, you're in the wrong place. I don't know. I do not have a business license to help you there. Once you're dead, 
Bon voyage. More power to you. And I bet some of you will do just smashingly well once you're dead. There's certainly plenty of city verbal and written support for that premise, so have at it. Now back to reality. <laughs> now back to a reality that makes some sense. <clears throat> so let's assume that now we've got the one out of every hundred million that come by. People who have the potential, who have the hunger for something outside of city life, outside the normal development of man neurally. The would-be mystics. Now we have this whole group where we can divide them into two. And that's easy to do. And that is those, let's say, just make it simple again, that what they're after is this experience. This you know, moment of satori, of being blown away. Reaching union with the Buddhahood. Whatever it is, the experience is what they all want. They all go, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's easy to divide them up into two classes. No problem. There's the one time that dichotomies... You, you can let them in even without saying put on a tire. I mean, you can't keep them out. There are two types. Those that succeed, that is, those that have the experience and those that don't. Mm -hmm. Now, the latter group wouldn't care for the distinction whatsoever. But, I mean, you're looking up a rat's ass. You can't get away from it. There it is. Let us say that out of the group, those two, that they both attempt in their own various ways, in their own individual ways, to pursue some sort of activity that they believe might be conducive to having the experience. And that's, the, that's what a reasonable person would do. Ordinary people, the ones that were not part of the group I'm describing, those that did blink, just ordinary people, they end up with their own hobbies. You know, fame and fortune and all of them good entertaining stuff of ordinary life. They end up doing that. Which if a person, let's say, has a talent playing guitar, painting, and they have a talent and they enjoy it, then what do you expect less? I mean, you have got to be very limited in just ordinary intelligence not to see, well, what else would a reasonable man do? What would be profitable in his life? Just an ordinary man, he loves to play the guitar. I don't know whether he's good. I don't have a good ear for music. I don't know the kind of music. But he's, he enjoys it. He plays all the time. He's always writing songs. And anybody listening to me will play. It, to him, it is profitable. What else do you expect? How can you, you would have to be truly, not just a Philistine in a cultural artistic sense, but a Philistine of intellect. Not to see that even if you don't approve of it, even if you don't understand, why does somebody want to collect old cars? Why does somebody even want to spend all their money on a car? I don't understand it. But it seems to get him through the night. The same way. Now back to the group of people who apparently have a hobby that is not earthbound. They have a hobby that's somewhere that you can't quite put your hand on. The would-be mystics. Then what are you going to do? Being a reasonable person. We're still assuming that those kinds of, thus far, the kind of would-be mystics I said that went by were physically sound enough, the nervous system, that they're not insane. Because there is a distinction between an insane person and a more conscious person. Now I pointed out again tonight, and not many of you seem to particularly enjoy it, so I won't, <laughs> I won't press on it at this moment. But there is a slight distinction. <laughs> Even the would-be mystics have got to pursue something. The man who, may, he may never be famous, as a guitar player, as a songwriter, as a painter. But if that is his real interest in life, that is what pleases him. He enjoys it. He doesn't know where it's going to go. What else would he do than to pursue it in his spare time or all the time he could? As, as often as he feels the enjoyment and the need, I will sit down and strum my guitar. I'd like to pull out the paints and brushes and paint some. You know, maybe I'll get somewhere. Maybe I'll get famous. I don't know. But it's you know, what I enjoy. What less can you expect of an ordinary sane person, be they would-be mystical or otherwise? But speaking of the former group, the would-be mystics, what I've been saying is not an attack on all of the many practices and etc. But there was a man tonight in one of the atoms that said one day it struck him, he asked himself, what is it 
Now, how did it start that men believed that, in some, that depriving themselves physically could result in intellectual rewards? I sort of doctored it up, but that's exactly what I'm talking about. It's not an attack, but think about it. Once you start, when you first start, what are you going to do? You read a book, you read an idea, you read a school, you read someone who tries to describe the description, who, the experience. You go, that's it, that's it. And of course, then the first thing you do is read more in the book or whoever you heard somebody say it, but it seems like that it's historically sound that most people get the first impetus from a book that they read about it. And then you want to think, well, how'd he get there? You know, will he tell me? Or did he tell me in the front of the book and I missed it? The practices, the traditions, they're always what? They're always some form of depriving oneself physically. My kind of current maps, I can put it to you another way, it is always a kind of leaning upon one's hormonal self, on one's physical being. That you take yourself apart from life. That's the widest possible uh, example, is the monastic life. That, well, I'm just going to take myself out of general life. But even it becomes even more specialized normally in those traditional monasteries. Uh, monastic settings that once you get in there you've cut yourself off to some degree from the outside world and we're not taking up or attacking the outside ordinary world but you do understand you are depriving yourself now the mystics will say well it's got to be for a reason because the guy that I read that had the experience that sounded like what I want he did it and you asked the head of the monastery was he actually here yes he, he found the monastery and all of you agree with it well yes I mean if you're going to do this it's just a matter of practicality. You're better off to be here amongst other people trying it than to be out there in life. You say, well, that makes sense. So you're depriving yourself physically. But then even in there, in uh, terms more specific, what do people do? At first blush, an ordinary man might say, well, Jesus, that's enough. You know, an ordinary guy out there working on his car, that that's his hobby. If he thought, well, if I was trying to do something strange, that kind of weird mystical shit... Uh, you know, just going to a monastery would be enough. You might got to get my car. You know, I can't date. I can't go out and drink it. You know, I got to stay in there the rest of my life. And they go, yeah. He thinks, well, you know, what else could you give up? But they get inside and do even more. What? Deprivation. Once you get in there, they say, oh, by the way, you can only sleep two hours a night. You go, okay. Oh, and we only eat once a day. You go, well, you know, I guess I'll get used to it. A half a piece of bread each meal. <laughs> And of course, no sex. <laughs> and then you have to work out there in the fields 14 hours a day. You understand? The whole thing is a depriving of oneself physically. You could easily make that sound as though it was a waste of time. You could make it sound as though, that, uh, or you could take some smart ass cynical view of that. But what I was trying to get you to see in general at night is if you look back, that there it is that. The group that went through that did not blink at the original experience, even though they didn't know what it was, they did not blink, and then they end up being would-be mystics. In a sense, wanting to have the experience and have it under cert such conditions that they'll know they had it. <laughs> they don't know where to start. So you end up plagiarizing, you end up engaged in some form of cannibalism off someone who says they've done it, or you read about it, and you go, yes, that's it. How do I do it? And life looking after itself is why I was pointing out that most people will get it from a book, which is to say most people will get their original seed from a dead person. Because you can't get your hands on them and say, damn it, tell me exactly how you did it. Show me right where you were. Tell me everything you did, everything you ate. Everything you saw. Oh, you got some written words. So what are you going to do? You've got to do something. If you're going to, if your desire in life, if your joy seems to be playing music, and you think, well, I saw two or three tapes and no recording contracts. I didn't even write back. But see, you think, well, i got to do something. So maybe you think, well, maybe I need more instruction. Maybe I should go to school and take up, at least in spare time, take up composition, maybe some music theory, or save my money and go to a good music teacher. And say, so just fooling around. You have to do something. 
So there would be mystics. They thought, well, I've got to do something. Here it is in the book. That, that's the description. That's what it is. I didn't know it, but that's what I was meant to be as a mystic. I may have to work in a service station. That may be my job, but now I know what I am. I'm a Sufi. I'm a yogi. I'm a Zen. Er. <laughs> and you think, well, but how do I get going? So you have to do something. You have to start somewhere. But notice where you the starting of somewhere it is always a matter of physical deprivation of some kind. But now ask yourself. It's not an attack. We're now asking ourselves as reasonable people. Super reasonable. How did man come up? How did... We're not attacking man. How did things arrange themselves in man's mind in such a way that there is this absolutely unassailable belief unexamined but unassailable belief that if you are in, interested in some extraordinary experience I called it intellectual you could call it spiritual if, you're, if that's what you're interested in that kind of payoff that kind of extraordinary reward in some way will come about through physically depriving yourself you know, fasting giving up and it gets a little more refined if you those who, the more sophisticated of the simple-minded, of the nine, of the dreaming mystics, they would say, well, it's not just giving up food and sex. It's giving up other coarser human activities, such as anger. And they'll start getting into emotions. But they might as well be getting into sleep two hours a night. You go, I'm not sure I can do that. It's the same thing as saying, don't get angry. Give up sex. Well, maybe I can give up sex if I'm in here and locked in. Uh, not just give it up. Quit having lustful thoughts. You know, they might as well tell you. Fly. <laughs> <laughs> but what is it? There is, the, there is a useful point to all this. Oh, we got any tape left? Second? The connection between a man's body and his mind. Is it the same kind of body, that, uh, same kind of connection I was pointing out to you between hormones and neurons as I was been calling them? But to say that you are in some way going to deprive one of them, and in that, and by so doing, you're going to feed the other one, does that not smell, if not wrong, does that not smell of the possibility of being less than maximally, optimally profitable? And the answer, since we're running out of tape, is you're goddamn right. <laughs> Unless you're an ordinary mystic. And then you go, well, what else am I going to do? If you got this far, one time you didn't blink. But look how far some of you are gone, and now you're starting to blink. And some of you that have been around a while have already blinked. Again. The only place the secret is, is here. Everywhere else is mystical. There's a definition tonight. Ancient historical mystical tradition. Something to do until the rocket bus gets here. <laughs> that is the ordinary. The dreaming mystics think the experience will be the climax of my life. And all the rest of this is the preface. You can't do it. If you, that's all you're going to do, they're right. Because they'll never have it. So put yourself in a position, even if you don't feel like that you belong in the position of the second part, the experienced, look at it just the opposite. That the experience is their life. The rest of it's waiting on the bus. Because you're not on the bus every day. But a few days ago, there was another definition of a real mystic is one who will insist just absolutely, that finally, he will not be satisfied until every morning he wakes up. Every morning, each and every morning is a brand new mystical experience. He won't be satisfied. But that doesn't mean it's going to happen. So the rest of it is you're waiting on the bus. It's something to distract yourself. But the rest of them end up, any of you who have been around long enough to remember my story of the ants and the map, the picnic, and them coming back, they end up, you're eating the maps, end up the napkins, not just eating them, living on them, and being satisfied with it. Choke. That was back to the story of the ants and the napkins.